Welcome to another edition of Swing States. I'm Fox 8 senior political reporter Bob Buckley. We have something a little different for you tonight. Mitch Kokai from the John Locke Foundation in Raleigh and State Senator Michael Garrett from Guilford County are going to give us insight into everything from presidential and gubernatorial races to education and voting rights. Gentlemen, welcome. Thanks, Bob. You know, since we're a purple state, I don't know if you can see that. I went purple today. I thought it was representative. And you are too, Michael. Good job. Great minds thinking. And you're representing both parties. <laughs> That's right. Blue and That's red. right. Um, although I think you guys probably have some divergent views, which is why we asked you here. You know, it's interesting how we're such a purple state now, but that hasn't always been the case. If you look back in history, between 1876 and 1964, the Democrats won 22 out of 23 presidential races in North Carolina. The one miss was when the Democrats had the audacity to uh, nominate a Catholic for president in 1928, Al Smith, the governor of New York. And then uh, starting in 76, uh, the Republicans have won 12 of 14. Of course, Jimmy Carter won in, uh, actually starting in 68, the Republicans have won 12 of the last 14. 06 was a Jimmy Carter win and 08 was Barack Obama and he was truly a uh, candidate unlike any other when he ran. So what's changed in the state, do you think, over that time? Guys? What has made us so democratic for so long? Well, we know the Civil War, of course, had much to do with that. And now so Republican and, and sort of mashed up as purple. What's going on? Well, part of it would be the rise of the Republican Party, because uh, after the, the end of the Reconstruction era and the return of the, the Democrats to, part, to power, there wasn't much of a Republican Party left, uh, mainly in western North Carolina, I think. And it was only in the late 60s, early 70s that Republicans first started to get a toehold as a statewide party with the Holzhauser win and right. the Helms win in 72. And then it's taken a long time, but North Carolina kind of followed the pattern that you saw in some of the other southern states, which used to be the solid South for right. the Democrats, but then became more Republican, though we are still much more purple than right. a lot of those other states. What do you see? Uh, Michael, you you're, haven't been in politics all that long, pretty young guy, but what do you see about the, the makeup of the state politic today? Well, I, I mean, I, I take a little exception to call North Carolina a strong Republican state. I, I think we're, we're much more... They have a winning streak. They have a winning streak right. uh, when you cherry pick certain offices. <laughs> but we can go look right. at the gubernatorial races right. and the streak is a little different. We've so, talked about that. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's, um, it's a little bit about where, where voters are falling. I think it also is a lot about the politicians that are putting in the work to mm -hmm. reach voters, to meet voters where they are and who are actually talking about the issues that families care most about. And I think mm -hmm. Republicans have, have been really good at messaging, um, not so good at governing, uh, especially mm -hmm. in most modern history, if you look at that. Um, and I, so I think, I think North Carolina is, is, remains a purple state. I don't think it's solidly Republican or solidly Democrat. And, and, to, and to your point, one of the things that we saw for a number of years, it's changed a little bit, but for a number of years we saw that a lot of North Carolina races would go for the Democrat if it were a statewide right. race and the Republican if it was national. I think, I think the thought the was, I think the thought was, hey, you know, right. we don't want to vote for these Northeastern mm -hmm. liberals who aren't good North Carolina people, but our North Carolina Democrats, we know them. They're people like us. Yeah. Uh, did you ever know Bob Shaw when he was a state senator here, Michael? You might be too young to remember him. I met him a few times, but okay. I knew his wife. When he was in the state senate for at a time, he was the only Republican. It was 49 Democrats and Bob Shaw. He could caucus all by himself on the way to and from Raleigh. It was great. I so, would love to be in those caucus meetings. <laughs> <laughs> arguing with himself. So what's going to happen? What's your guess on what will happen in this presidential race if it were today? Who would win? I think President Biden pulls it out um, by a l little more than a point. I think that the Biden campaign um, is really putting in the work right now. The president's been to North Carolina multiple times. The vice president's been to North Carolina, I think, over 12 times. Um, the organization that they're putting in place as far as canvassing, um, organizing communities, meeting voters where they are, which is, I think, how you win elections in North Carolina, mm -hmm. is by that door-to-door -door contact and having conversations on people's front door. My understanding is that's where they're putting their money. Less, fewer TV ads, more door-to-door -door contact. What do you think, Mitch? Who wins? I would say today you give the edge to Donald Trump just because he's won the electoral votes the last two times. Now he won by about 75,000 votes the last time, so it's not a case where he can just say, oh, North Carolina is in the bag. But I would definitely say that if you had to bet money today, yeah. you bet on him with the thought that 
President Biden and his team certainly could win. The two polls I've seen, WRAL out of Raleigh and the Marist poll, both have Trump up by five points today in a head-to-head -head matchup. But now you've got this great third idea here, RFK Jr. trying to get on all the ballots, sometimes as a libertarian, I think sometimes just without a party. Uh, RFK skews it. What do we make of this? I know your party, Michael, is not happy with this. Well, I think if you look at where RFK's campaign is trying to get on the ballot, it seems to be only in swing states where he could play the role of a spoiler and, and deny the president um, from reaching the 270 to win the Electoral College. Um, a lot of the donors are, ba are also shared Trump donors. So I, the reason my party takes a lot of exception with it, which is I, I do as well, it seems to me it is an effort that is a strategic effort to help the Trump uh, campaign win in those toss-up states. What do you think of the RFK? Will he, do you think he'll make it on? Will he spoil this for Biden? Because I, I think he'll take votes from both. I, I think he will take votes for both, and so that'll make it interesting. Does he get more people who are disaffected people who but don't want to go with Trump, or does he get people who are typically Democrats but don't think Biden has what it takes? Yeah, and I think there's probably an equal number of those on each side. But, you know, when it comes to voting, there's a big issue still out there, and this is one that you've been covering a lot, Mitch. Voter ID, e voter ID is the law of the state today. This may change next month because there's a hearing right here in Winston-Salem. What's going on with this? Yeah, we know that there have been multiple legal challenges to voter ID yeah. over the years. The state Supreme Court last April said voter ID was fine under the North Carolina Constitution, but that helped revive a federal lawsuit against voter ID. And so there's a trial before uh, Judge Loretta Biggs on May 6th. She's already shown she's not a big fan of voter right. ID. She tried to put an injunction in to block voter ID that the Fourth Circuit later threw out. But she has another chance, and if she says no to voter ID, that could change things for November. Now, what, what do you make of all this, Michael? Because as I remember right, when voter ID passed in a referendum, 67% of African Americans voted for it. Is it not a good idea? I mean, I'm, I've always been opposed, um, or I historically was opposed to voter ID in North Carolina, but my issue wasn't so much about, on principle, having to show a photo ID to vote. It was how North Carolina was implementing the law for voter ID that I thought was discriminatory. For example, when you write the law that says you can use a hunting and fishing license mm -hmm. as, uh, to, to vote, but not a college ID, it seemed to me that we were targeting a certain demographic, which I think any time you deny people their constitutional right of participating in free and fair elections, that's wrong. Understood. All right, coming up next, two statewide races of huge importance, the governor's race and the superintendent of public instruction. They're not your normal races this time around. Welcome back to Swing State. Tonight we have Michael Garrett, a state senator from Guilford County, and Mitch Kokai, senior political an analyst at the John Locke Foundation in Raleigh. Gentlemen, a couple of statewide races we'll get to in a minute. Before we do, we've got to talk just about the parties. Uh, it seems as if you cannot delineate Donald Trump and his followers from the Republican Party writ large, which is normal when you have someone nominated by a party three times in a row. But there used to be wings and factions. I don't know that there are any wings and factions in the Republican Party. It is a Trump MAGA party. Would you agree, Mitch? I mean, you're a conservative, you're not a Republican, but you are a conservative. So that's the natural home for Republicans. It has been for a couple of generations. It is. I would say there are still some divisions within the Republican Party because there are the folks who say Donald Trump, whatever he supports, that's what we're going to support. And right. then there are the others who have more the, the traditional values of free trade mm -hmm. and limited taxes and Nikki uh, Haley, Ron DeSantis, yeah, but yeah, they got crushed in the primaries. They did. And I think the Republican Party is largely the Trump party. The question is, how long does that last and how how much does it translate beyond Trump to whoever is right. the next person? Because if, if Donald Trump had decided not to run this time around, it probably would have been a DeSantis or a Haley who would have been Trump adjacent, but not Trump. And, and Mike, along those lines, I, I know they, I, I'm, I'm assuming you're not a big fan of a lot of the MAGA stuff. Um, Safe assumption. Right, fair, I figured. But more than $50 million has been raised and spent by Democrats to, to help MAGA candidates get nominated because they thought they were easier to beat. And so we've got this dichotomy where some Democrats say the MAGA movement is an existential threat to democracy and then they work to get them nominated. I find that a little cynical. 
Is that fair? Oh, I find it cynical, and I think both sides do it. Mm -hmm. um, I think you, the Republican Party helped a state representative in the Charlotte area get elected, who then changed party registration um, and gave the House a supermajority. So both, both parties play that game. I think it's uh, detrimental to the democratic process because you need two functioning political right. parties to have a free marketplace of ideas and debate. And we're not debating policy ideas anymore. We have mm -hmm. the Democratic Party who has a set of policy proposals, who has a party platform and puts forward their ideas. Mm -hmm. You have, to me, the Trump Republican Party is just, it's about anger and trying to demonize certain segments of the population without coming forward with any real solid ideas and proposals that can be debated by other rational thinkers. Well, there may be some border security and inflation, free trade, energy, those type of things. But but let's stay with with what our main subject is here, because we have a case where a Trump acolyte, Mark Robinson, is a Republican nominee for governor. Does he? he the latest uh, polls I've seen, he's down two points within the margin of error, but still. Well, how, how do we make the Mark Robinson candidacy what it means for the Republican Party in this state, Mitch? Well, it's going to be interesting to see what it means. I mean, I think Mark Robinson was far and away the candidate of the Republican base. Mm -hmm. He won the primary hands down against uh, State Treasurer Dale Falwell, who before that election had been very popular mm -hmm. among Republicans. I think was one of the highest vote getters the last time around when he ran for treasurer again. And Bill Graham, who threw in a ton of his own right. money to try to win that race. And in, in his ads, if you saw them, he appealed to typical Republican issues. That didn't stop Mark Robinson. It'll be interesting to see how that plays with the general election. I mean, you have basically two very interesting candidates. You have Mark Robinson, who is the first African-American candidate for governor to be nominated by one of the major parties. With, and you have Josh with, Stein, who's the first Jewish candidate right. to be nominated by one of the parties. They're very different in both right. style and substance, and it's going to be a clear difference. You've got one guy who's sort of career politician in Josh Stein, and then you've got the other who has like no political experience. I mean, is that not going to be trouble for Republicans to push this guy who has had very little time in substantive office? I mean, I think the larger challenge is not his political experience because I think a lot of times we see voters wanting someone with less experience that comes from the real world. Right. I think the issue is going to be uh, a lot of his statements from being a Holocaust denier to calling members of the LGBTQ community um, filth. Uh, you know, his stance on abortion, that once a woman is pregnant, it's no longer her body or her choice anymore. Um, I think those positions are well outside the mainstream. I think that's where the Republican Party runs into the bigger challenges of pushing his campaign forward. Can Democrats find a, a balance with Republicans on abortion, do you think? Would, is there any level where you say, okay, we can settle here in the middle? I think if you look at the polling mm -hmm. where the Democratic Party is, which said, Roe should be still the law of the land, and that if we were to ever take control of the General Assembly in Raleigh, we would codify that into law. Um, I, that's where the majority of North Carolinians well, are. I don't think that's a hard argument to no, make. No, well, the polling is very strong in that about three quarters to two, more than three quarters want it available in the first trimester, but it flips to at least three quarters want it severely restricted in the last trimester. That's been consistent. Uh, our polling has showed that basically two thirds of the people are either have almost no abortions with some exceptions or have it generally available with some exceptions. And then you have 10 to 12 percent on both ends who say no abortion ever or mm. no restriction ever. Yeah, yeah I think it's going to be a tough one. People are so locked in. Well, just a minute or two. To, I want to touch, though, on the Department of Public Instruction. You've got Mo Green, who's the Democratic nominee, ran our school system here in Guilford County for seven years, eight years. Uh, and then you've got Michelle Morrow on the Republican side, who Democrats have done their homework on and dug up some interesting statements. She's not exclusively, but largely homeschooled her kids it was an interesting choice for the Republicans against a sitting superintendent in the primary to knock her out and nominate this new person. Catherine Truitt got hurt by a couple of things. One was she was the superintendent as we were dealing with all the issues of COVID. And I yeah. think a lot of people blamed her for the way schools dealt with COVID. Also, uh, among the Republican base, which is who votes in the primary, she was seen as someone who was not very inclined to go along with conservatives. Sometimes mm -hmm. she would support their issues, but a lot of times it was just 
okay, I'm, I'm kind of uh, giving you backhanded compliments rather than being full-blown supporter. Well, she was superintendent for all the students, and not all are conservatives. Michael, I mean, this is going to be a race I'm sure Democrats are going to put a lot of emphasis on. Well, I'm sure. And I mean, you know, I have two young children. Mm -hmm. uh, one is in kindergarten. Charlotte, my younger daughter, will be in kindergarten soon. And the idea that the state superintendent, someone that we should want our children looking up to for leadership, has said some really horrific things like we should put uh, President Obama's execution on pay-per-view and try to make money off of it is far, far outside the mainstream. Even, goes even to if your, joking, although she's probably going to claim, you know, it was I, my private friends, they understood what I meant. It'll probably be what we'll hear from her. I, I don't care. If, yeah. I don't think comments like that, private or public, right. you, you're, you're not worthy of that office. Understood. Office. We are going to try to get into some of the stuff that you'll be dealing with in the state legislature when we get back, as well as maybe some time for local issues, including Greensboro, trying to mimic Raleigh and Charlotte. We'll be right back. Welcome back. A bit more to discuss tonight, including a real contentious issue in the triad. Now, some Greensboro city leaders have been pushing for a while for what is essentially a restaurant tax. They call it a prepared food tax. And Raleigh and Charlotte have similar taxes to bankroll infrastructure that attracts big events. And Greensboro Coliseum would be a big winner in this. I know you, neither one of you may necessarily be voting on something like this, but you deal in these issues. Uh, is it a good idea from what you've seen at the Locke Foundation about it's worked in Raleigh and Charlotte and we feel like we're falling behind here? Well, we've generally not been in favor of raising taxes, but, you know, if Guilford wants to raise its own taxes <laughs> and the people, especially if it's put to a vote and people say we want it, then, then, then I they mean, can. We, we see the benefit of all these events. So Michael, you do being here, you've seen the economic driver the Coliseum is. Does it make sense to try to keep up with Raleigh and Charlotte with something like this? I mean, I think the triad is unique. I don't think we should copy any other city just for the sake of it. Um, and I think as far as the prepared uh, meal tax, if it's something that the leaders here want to pass, and I, I anticipate they'll be asking the General Assembly uh, for some legislation to allow that, that, they definitely need to make the case to the public um, in a more effective way than they have, because I know people, I hear from people all the mm -hmm. time, it's not even on our calendar or on the agenda right now, are already voicing their opposition. Uh, in the past, the Republicans have had a super majority in the Assembly, so it makes your job a little less exciting. Uh, you can scream from the rafters, but there isn't a whole lot you can do on some of these cases. This is why the Josh Stein race is going to be so important for the governor, for you guys, because you need some backstop. Yeah, well, we need Josh Stein to win the governor's race, and then we also need to pick up at least one seat in the North mm -hmm. Carolina Senate so we can sustain vetoes. This session, uh, the Republicans have a supermajority in the Senate, so the governor's vetoes were, all, all of his vetoes were overridden this session. And I, th and I think one reason that was true was the previous four years, there had not been a supermajority. So I think in at least a couple of the uh, mm -hmm. occasions when there was a veto this time around, the General Assembly, the Republicans weren't even necessarily all that excited about the bills, but they mm -hmm. overrode the veto just because they could. That's not necessarily good, is it? Uh, that's the way politics works. You see all kinds of crazy things happen in the General Assembly and say, you know, I thought I was gone from high school. <laughs> you know, a lot of stuff <laughs> happened quickly when the Republicans finally gained control in the 90s. And the Democrats were like, why are you trying to do so much so quickly? And I think the idea was Republicans were on the outside in the wilderness for so long. They had all this pent up energy and ideas. They finally got control. And they're going to try to change everything all at once. And that's kind of what's going on here to some degree, right? I mean, they're still trying to get through 100 years of theory and ideas. Yeah, I think once the Republicans took control of the General Assembly, both chambers in 2011, there was a lot of effort to try to say, OK, let's, let's tackle some of the big issues that, that we want to do on taxes and regulatory reform, school choice, that sort of thing. I think what we're seeing now, though, is that the, the folks who are outside of government who kind of want the General Assembly to do different things, have figured out how to work with Republicans. In 2011 and 2012, they were caught flat-footed. No one expected them to win. And so the infrastructure outside of the General Assembly was used to dealing with Democrats, not with Republicans. And so now, after more than a decade of Republicans in power, the people who want, who want to come in and get special deals here and there are able to get a, a better in to the powers, uh, to the quarters of power. Michael, if you have an idea that is good, can you sell it to some Republicans? Can you work and find ways to get it done? Yeah, I think that's one of the things that is unique about the North Carolina Senate that is 
totally different than what people are used to seeing on television. Uh, we still can work together. We still get along. We're still friends. Um, you know, if you can find common ground, and for me, usually that's around economic development issues. Mm -hmm. um, we've made great progress on energy policy in this state in the last session. So, you know, when, when you can find common ground, you, you can definitely execute. Will there be common ground on school vouchers? Now, the idea the Republicans say is the poorest families want this more than anyone, and they're in some of the worst schools. They're going to claim the money they're putting away for vouchers is above and beyond what they're going to appropriate for education, K through 12. Are you okay with vouchers? Absolutely not. Okay. I, I think vouchers, I mean, if you just look, like that's what they say, but that's not what happens. Okay. I mean, we are right now letting people, who, millionaires who have their kids already in private school, apply for vouchers. And that money is going to come directly out of a school system that is already underfunded. You can walk into most schools here in Guilford County and you can see the needs um, and they're, they're immense needs. They did take the schools. cap off for who can apply recently. Uh, Mitch, well, how do you feel about the vouchers? Well, that's a good idea because parents should have school choice. And the, the idea that the millionaires and billionaires are using this money, they can't actually at this mm -hmm. point because the way, even though the income threshold was raised, the money is doled out first to those who are at the lowest incomes. And right now with the money that's in the budget mm -hmm. this time around and 72,000 new applications, all of that money is going to be gone by the time they get to the second income tier. None of the higher income okay. families are going to get this. What money. do you make of the Democratic argument, though, that this money should, you know, it's not truly above and beyond the public education budget. It's sort of carved out of it. Well, it's not carved out of the budget, but I think the argument is if they didn't put the money in the vouchers, yeah. they could put more money right. in the public schools. And what the Republicans have responded is we are putting more money in the public schools and we're putting money in these vouchers. Well, the Republicans are, but I've done crunch the numbers and they've kept up and slightly better than inflation, but not a whole lot better than inflation. Now, the argument becomes, and it's difficult as we're down to our last minute, is the fact that you're gonna ask someone like me who's making far, you know, perhaps 10% less than I did 10 years ago to pay more taxes so the teachers who are ahead of inflation can stay even further ahead of inflation. That's the tough argument to make, Michael. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we talk about let's run government like a business. Mm -hmm. um, every business leader would tell you their most important asset, their most valuable asset is their people. So you have to keep, maintain, and retain mm -hmm. them. Um, and so running our school system the same way. You need to, we need to be a first class place for schools in this country if we're going to continue to be competitive. Mm -hmm. And being able to retain and attract top talent top talent teachers is, is got to be mission number one for the General Assembly. And I think we're hoping that with all the economic development you've helped to bring in that we're going to have the money for that going forward. We'll see. All right, gentlemen, thank you. That is it for tonight. Please tune in or set your DVR to Recording Swing Week each week to get the kind of in-depth look and key issues that shape our community. We'll see you next time.